Hey, folks, Zach Osmond here. I am insider Indianapolis Star, trying to set a record for fastest spoken intro uh, in the history of podcasting. It is August 15th, 2024. This is Mind Your Banners for August 15th, 2024. He's Mike Nislick, as always. And uh, Mike, it's fair to say we are kind of in the teeth of the football preseason now. Teams have been in pads for a little while. Indiana's going to have, I think, its second scrimmage. Uh, this weekend and the first thing to say is is no surprise but I still think it's worth discussing um, if for no reason other than because people will inevitably ask about it Um, I think it's I think it's fair to say at this point Indiana's got a starting quarterback I know Kurt Signetti has sort of said you know that he he's not going to name one but at no point has he really ever indicated that anybody is particularly close to Curtis Rourke and I think Monday he even sort of used the um the the so he suggested basically that Rourke created even more separation and this is a player that already took every snap at the first team in the spring game uh you know Kurt Signetti said at media day team or uh, conference media days I, I sleep better at night knowing we've got him now you're hearing about him separating even more during the first live scrimmage um of fall camp I I think it we can we can all probably complete this math equation yeah, I mean, there's nothing unless he's playing some long con. Uh, that there's no, and, but, but I mean, he's. I think he's playing it straight. Um, you know, t- Tom Allen's wording last year, where I've named a starter, and it was both of them. I don't, I don't think that's this kind of situation. I think <laughs> I think that um, you know this is pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, once Curtis Rourke took all the first team snaps, uh, I think in the spring game, I think you kind of saw where this was headed. You know, I think you keep it open just because, you know, he, he's always said he wants competition. You want the guys kind of focused over the summer and invested and sort of, you know, thinking that they all have, you know, a chance based on if they do make a step forward. But I, I think Rourke was always ahead. Um, you know, he, he kind of has been complimentary of Taven kind of throughout the process. But at the same time, I mean, uh, on on Monday he listed a bunch of areas where you know he Jackson needs to get better, um, you know, a lot of the small things that come with experience, you know, and I think that's what Rourke's had throughout the whole process that it was going to be hard for Taven to overcome, you know, going against a guy with four years of experience, three thirty three career starts, um, that was just too valuable, and and that's what they brought him in, and so I think that that was pretty straight, you know pretty easy to see why he won the job yeah i think there's there's two things that kind of especially when you sort of loop Taven jackson into it and i think the freshmen are kind of their own thing it's clear that yeah. the staff has been impressed by tyler cherry but he's still a true freshman and you know mendoza's only been on campus since the summer he couldn't i think his high school had some there was no mechanism for him to graduate early the way that cherry didn't enroll in january so um so both those guys are very young i think the first thing I, I would say is I, I do think Signetti's, um, you know, sort of praise of Taven Jackson is genuine in the sense that I, I it, like it, it seems like his tone has been more and more positive of around Jackson basically for the last like eight months and what he saw in the spring and, you know, what he, um, you know, maybe the, the, the strides Jackson's taken and he's been in a weird way, like when a coach starts to get more specific about the stuff a guy needs to improve on, you feel like they're paying more attention, essentially, that that like it, it that, that player's gotten more of the coach's attention and therefore the coach has kind of more to say and, and, and think about. Um, I think that um, in, in one way, and I'm not trying to make this out to be some, you know, genius level handling of the quarterback position, but in one way, actually, I think the way Signetti's handled it has also just kind of taken pressure off younger players to just sort of say, like, you don't, ha- don't feel, yes, he's left the competition open, but, but don't feel that pressure to just prove yourself every single time, just go get better. There is, you know, it, it, and this kind of layers into the other thing that I've sort of, I don't know, conclusion, I guess I've sort of drawn from this, this process, which is the shifting nature of how you treat a transfer quarterback, you know, even five years ago, you'd go get a quarterback out of the portal and it would be like, well, we need an experienced guy to come in and create some competition. I remember Indiana took a guy out of Arizona a few years ago. And I think Indiana had every intention of of letting him compete for the starting job, but he just didn't win it. And I don't think you can really in the NIL era, when you're talking about, you know, going in and, and, and putting real 
you know, financial figures in front of these guys and the way that process works, I don't think you can just sort of say, Hey, we're, we're going to do this to bring you in to just kind of see what you got. Basically. And if you're going to go get someone, especially someone, as you said, as experienced as Curtis work really has nothing to prove, nothing left to prove at the college level anywhere, except where he is right now. Um, you do kind of create, you know, this situation where on the one hand, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty clear that you're signposting your way toward Curtis work being your starter. But on the other, you know, you think about a year ago where Indiana is asking two redshirt freshmen with very little experience to compete for the quarterback job. You know, someone like Curtis Rourke isn't just a sort of security blanket because of his, his experience. It's it's also an ability to look at all your younger quarterbacks and just say, like, don't don't come in here every day. Stress that you've got to figure out how to pack, you know, four years of experience and, and leadership and intangibles into six months. Just get better. And and the more you progress, you find out where you are kind of when it matters, whether that's competing for the job in fall camp, whether that's the guy in front of you goes down and you have to step in. I just, I, like I said, I'm not trying to make this some sort of galaxy brain praise of the way Kurt Signetti's handled it. I, I just think that it has kind of wound up in a situation that's probably benefited all parties. Yeah, and I mean, we, I think Indiana has shown over the last, what, three years, three seasons, you know, the backup quarterback position is one of the most important. <laughs> More know, than like, that, Indiana hasn't had a starting quarterback day one make it through the entire season since 2018. Peyton Ramsey, I'd have to go back and check, but I'm almost certain Ramsey started all 12 games in 18. That's the last time Indiana made it through an entire season, full season, COVID season, anything, without having, without starting multiple quarterbacks at least once. And in 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 most cases, it was because of injury. Yeah, and, and so I mean, you you kind of see that you have to have a guy that um, you can trust and that you you believe in a little bit, and so I think Jackson certainly fits that mold. And you want to have him, you know, you need to develop him because I mean, you need to you, you know have him ready just in case. And you've seen it, you know, like you said, going back so far um, that uh, you you have to have somebody that that's capable in that spot. I think the, the other part of it is just with Rourke, like there really is nothing left to ask him to do other than take the step up, you know, and, and, and I think that's in terms of obviously what you can see in his career stats and his film also just like what we've seen. I mean, you know, it, it sounds really simplistic, but you go back to that spring game, Taven Jackson looked really good in that spring game, albeit, you know, kind of in a setting where the second team defense was kind of weakened by injuries and things, but um you know, even still, Rourke just kind of knows how to carry himself like the guy. And I don't think you can – I mean, the last time Indiana had a quarterback that experienced it was, you know, and, and, may, and I'm not talking about, you know, total number of starts or attempts or whatever, but just that overall profile was probably Michael Penix. It was either Penix or Ramsey, you know, depending on kind of how you want to see their profiles, um, you know, established maybe is the right word. And – Again, you just you don't you don't go into the portal. You you aren't as intentional about recruiting a player like that if you're Indiana, if you don't intend on, you know, that player being, you know, pretty much the clear front runner for the job. And if somebody just absolutely comes on leaps and bounds, connects with the coaching staff, figures out the playbook, just it all slides into place, then all the better. But that's you know, that's that's not a move that's that's made just for you know, sort of like depth and competition and, hey, the, the older guy, you know, get every chance to win it. I mean, it's, you know, you, you do that for, for kind of one purpose and one purpose only. And I think you've seen, at least insofar as we can measure them right now, we will be able to measure them a lot better soon. Um, the benefits of that for Indiana, again, looking at thinking about where Indiana has been at quarterback the last couple of years, and then thinking about a first-year head coach, a lot of roster turnover, uncertainty, just having some steadiness and some experience at that level at such an important position, I think is is you know it may sound simplistic, but like it's it's important for Indiana when you kind of remember what not having that has done for Indiana the last couple of years. Yeah, I mean, and you've talked about his resume. I mean, you know, Ohio had what back-to-back. -back 
10 win season or I mean bowl games uh and you know one offensive player of the year obviously in in, in 2022 for for the mid-american conference um and, and kurt sickney's talked a lot about you know the way he processes information uh the, the amount of two minute drills he's run and those were all things that y- you can't get without experience like we've said and just it, it, you know i think he was ready from the day he stepped on campus to, to sort of uh be the starter um and you know he proved himself and that's all that that's all you needed to do and and he and he did it the other thing i would say is this doesn't i, I don't necessarily think this is guaranteed to be a like a a an every year thing like i think there's a world where you know especially if indiana winds up committing and signing julian lewis which you know i think you know as the as the summer progresses toward fall starts to look more realistic than maybe we thought it it once did um he's still committed to usc and until he decommits you know you you don't want to start making bold predictions and, and i will always return to the old steve spurrier line that a commitment before signing day just tells you who's ahead um but especially if you do wind up bringing in a quarterback of that caliber, adding it to the two freshmen you already have, and then a player in Taven Jackson, because Curtis work is out of eligibility after this year. This is his sixth year in college. Like there's, there's nothing left after this for him. So, you know, this is going to be a one year thing for Rourke. You're going to have Jackson who by this, by next year, be what a red shirt junior. He'll have had a year of, of time on task with the staff in the system, et cetera. You know, I don't know that necessarily, again, especially if Indiana does bring in a, a blue chip quarterback at, at, at Lewis's level. Um, I don't know if Indiana dips back into the portal in, in the same way, looking for that player. I think this is a, this is something specific to what Signetti felt like this team needed. And that, again, goes back to kind of this idea that from very early on, even going back to spring, while I know the, you know, the, the head coach and his assistants aren't going to say publicly or emphatically this is the starter it has always felt like it was sort of constructed to wind up in this place if that makes sense yeah I, and i i mean I, I i do agree if they did sign lewis you know that he changes the equation but i also think that you can't rule anything out in the portal era i mean they could easily decide uh you know they're going to need a lot of transfers uh, after the season and and you know if there's a quarterback that they love uh, that enters the portal that they think they could win with, I, I, you could easily see them go out and get them. Um, you know, it, signing Lewis, I think, makes that a, a trickier proposition. But um, I do think that, you know, there's all bets are off when the transfer portal opens in terms of, of what a team's going to do. Yeah, and what players are going to do. I mean, that's that's, yeah, that's the true. other side of it. Like, you know, you, you never you, – we could sit here and say, oh, Because does the to- whole quarterback room empty out if they get Lewis then? And then you say, well – we do need an experienced guy just to have, and you know, maybe that guy ends up winning the job. So you never know. Yeah. Um, I think the the biggest news, hard news, sort of confirmed news out of this week, uh, Nick Kidwell suffers a, a knee injury. It's season ending. The, the, you know, the extent of that, we don't know in terms of, is it ligament? Is it a meniscus? I, I don't think people ultimately really should care that much. The unfortunate reality for Indiana is, um, that a player who was really a rock for those James Madison offensive lines um, is, you know, Kurt Signetti's last, what, like four years, basically, three and a half, four years at James Madison. Kidwell transferred to Indiana, was expected to slot right in. I think probably right guard, I think, was is is where it seemed like, unless you saw something different. Um, but, you know, he was right up there, you know, in, in, in soccer. Was left, but, but well, it, either way, I mean, the point is guard, one of those interior yeah. spots. Um, there's a phrase in soccer called like first names on the team sheet, you know, and, and if you were drawing up a, 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 a first names on the offensive line, Kidwell's are up there, right up there next to Carter Smith and Mike Kadick as, as guys that I think Indiana would have thought, you know, no question, we're going to be counting on him as a real anchor. Um, you know, Indiana has some depth to replace him. Tyler Stevens, another Jamie transfer who's played a lot of different positions along the offensive line. Obviously if Indiana wanted to, you know, move around at center. Mike Kadick has played the guard positions before. Um, we've heard uh, Kurt Signetti name check Bray Lynch, and who I think is well, Bray Lynch is a redshirt sophomore now, I think. And Drew Evans, who was a Wisconsin transfer last year, as guys that that were kind of, you know, stepping up and providing some depth before the injury. So you would imagine those guys figure a little bit more prominently here. Um, but I think you – you do wind up in a situation if you're Indiana where 
either A, you're going to have to try and do this with fewer bodies, um, or B, you're going to maybe have to elect to play somebody a little bit sooner than you would like, especially maybe like a freshman whose red shirt you'd like to protect, something like that. Um, in any event, you know, this is this is going to be a tough replace for Indiana, you know, in the aggregate because Kidwell was one of their most experienced and probably one of their best offensive line. Well, we've talked about, I, I think uh, we both see them having a real path with their schedule to six, you know, to a bowl game at least um, and to having a successful uh, season. But the caveat has always been that this team does not have a ton of depth and it does not have a ton of depth specifically on both of the offense and offensive and defensive lines. Um, I, I think they had less depth at tackle uh, than they did on the interior. Um, so if you lost to Carter Smith, um, uh, you know, that would be sort of, I, I think, a even harder sort of road to, to try to, you know, climb. But um, this was a tough injury just because, like you said, A, Kidwell was a sort of, you know, once you stuck him at left guard, you weren't going to have to worry the rest of the season if he stayed healthy. Um, and, and two, now you sort of the rotation, everybody bumps up. And if there's another injury, which, you know, they haven't even played football, so I don't think it's out of the question to say um, there could be another injury too there, um, then you are playing a freshman or then you are playing somebody that you really didn't anticipate playing. Um, and, and now you're playing, you know, they had some experience uh, when you kind of looked at the line uh, with Kidwell in there, um, you know, Carter Smith, Kadick, and, you know, Trey Wendig, you know, that was a, a group that all had experience. So then you're only playing one inexperienced guy They're you know, bringing along somebody that um, just one guy at that spot. Um, now you're bringing up uh, along at least two. And so uh, I think you have more question marks there. And so, um, you know, the, the key to, you know, if quarter Curtis Rourke, as we said, is the starter, you know, one of the keys to his success is going to be keeping him, you know, protected. And we saw two years ago, the disaster Indiana had up front, um, you know, last year it was better. Um, but um, I, I do think this hurts just because, um, like you said, losing an experienced guy like that is never going to make things easier. No, and, and losing somebody and, you know, listen, I mean, I think this will become less of a concern as the season wears on, but also losing somebody that obviously is intimately familiar with the scheme um you know who i mean because we we talked to carter smith last week uh before the injury occurred and we didn't ask him about kidwell specifically but somebody asked him about i think it might have been me actually i didn't mean to make that sound like someone smart and handsome asked him about um the impact of having multiple you know wisconsin transfers who'd worked with bob bostad and then jmu transfers who knew the system so that even when you had some new guys there was a, a built-in familiarity there, whether it was with the, the, the coach or the scheme or whatever, you know, it, it, the other thing you can't really replace is a guy that has played so many snaps in this offense. So um, it, it is, I mean, I don't think there's any, any way around it. It is, it is a blow. And as you said, I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons we've talked about quarterback health at times in the last two or three years on this podcast is because Indiana's offensive line has struggled. And when the line struggles, the quarterback gets hit too often, and then those things start to wear a player down. And, and so. Curtis Rourke is not, not, not mobile, <laughs> but he's not a guy that uh, is going to just sort of scramble around back there and elude, uh, you know, oh, you know, everybody that that comes his way. So I mean, you do need to, you know, his 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 strength is going to be standing in the pocket and, and delivering, um, uh, you know, you, you're spreading the ball around, so. Um, you know, you, you do need to protect him and give him some time. The other thing I think the other interesting piece of that offense, getting to watch, you know, some of practice and, and talking to players about this. Um, Indiana is, it feels like is in a good place right now, receiver wise. Um, EJ Williams is back practicing. I know, I know there are uh, people who are excited about that. Um, but I think Donovan McCulley's had some good moments in what we've been able to see. Um, obviously, Elijah Serrett is another one of those JMU guys that was so, um, was so you know, sort of successful uh, with the staff back in Harrisonburg. You got a lot of experienced transfers that it feels like Indiana's going to rotate a lot. I think Omar Cooper, either Cooper, we talked to Cooper and McCulley on Wednesday, and one of the two of them basically just said, like, we're going to rotate all the time, and we're just always going to have fresh receivers on the field. I think you could look at some of Signetti's offenses, Mike Shanahan's offenses at JMU, 
and feel like they were going to be a little bit more receiver heavy that, you know, Indiana was pretty consistently at least a one tight end set under Tom Allen, you know, whether it was, you know, kind of no matter who the offensive coordinator was. And I don't think we won't see tight ends in this offense, but I mean, like, you know, Indiana ran 11 personnel a lot, no matter whether it was, you know, Mike DeBoer, Kalen DeBoer, Nick Sheridan, um, Walt Bell, like Indiana had a, a tight end H back type on the field a lot. I think you look at some of what JMU did the last couple of years and you feel like maybe Indiana is going to do more f- true for receiver sets. And you understand why, you know, everybody kind of when, when the receiver group comes up, everybody talks about depth and rotation is because it, it does feel like Indiana is going to roll through a lot of bodies there to stay fresh. Yeah. And that's exciting. I think um, just, and it's, it's an exciting style of offense when you have full receivers, you know, athletic, uh, you know, all that athleticism on the field, um, you know, I probably can count on one hand how many times that happened last year in terms of, like you said, having a four receiver set. I mean, they just didn't have A, enough healthy guys. They probably guys did they trusted. substantially more 12 personnel, which is two tight ends, than they did, like, I, I guess Absolutely. you call it 10 personnel. Is that what you call it? Bad. One yeah. back, no, no tight yeah. ends? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could count on one hand, like, you know, late game situation where you just need a bomb. I think maybe Illinois once or twice, but I mean, it was very rare. Um, and so, it, you know, I, I think it just it, it signifies it's a new era that, that and that they have the talent. I mean, I think you look at guys, um, too, that can do a lot. Um, you know, they got a, guys, a lot of guys that can work in the slot, but I think bounce outside. Um, you know, I think Price is an exciting um talent i mean he's you know he's had 500 yards i think the last three three seasons um he's sort of a guy i think is is intriguing um and then you kind of combine you know i think mccauley's excited because you know teams aren't you know going to be able to focus on him uh, as talented as he is uh you, you're just not going to be able to do it just because they have so many offensive weapons and i think zach horton is a guy too at tight end that's capable of lining up outside um, and giving them some versatility and 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 doing some things. So I, I think it's going to be a hard team um, to scheme against in terms of, um, you know, trying to lock down all those skill guys. The other thing you'd say, too, about an offensive line, you know, we often think about offensive line in terms of kind of it being the first, you know, the first sort of layer of an offense. And in a lot of ways it is, but if you have, quick athletic receivers and you have an offense that's built to get the ball moving quickly, then an offensive line will look a lot better if they don't have to block as much. You know, if, if, if you're doing a lot of like two step drop, one read, two read throws, you know, you've got, you've got route concepts and, 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 you know, play calls that get the ball out quickly and, you know, consistently find holes in a defense. And obviously a quarterback that can, you know, recognize that stuff, read that stuff and, and react quickly then your offensive line looks a lot better because if you're not asking them to block for a long time, then they're probably going to have more success. Um, the defensive side, I, I feel like is, is going to continue to be a little bit of a, um, like, a I don't know if mystery is the right word, but I just think that we, we kind of need to see the defense in action to know exactly what to expect. We've talked a lot about the depth issues. I think it's interesting you know, Kurt Signetti seemed to go out of his way Monday to say that he felt good about some of the pressure that the defense applied on the in the weekend scrimmage. Indiana only thudded in the weekend scrimmage. They didn't tackle. Not that you tackle quarterbacks anyway, but the point is, you know, it's it's some of that stuff can be a little bit fool's gold sometimes. And he kind of acknowledged like it's it's never a perfect, it's never an exact science measuring stuff like penetration and pressure when we're not letting, you know, quarterbacks escape, we're not letting running backs break tackles, that kind of thing but he seemed pleased with it. And when you pair that to, I was trying to find this and, and I could not find one place that, that had it reliably. If James Madison wasn't number one in the country last year in havoc rate, then it was like top five. So it, just, nobody, nobody kept the stat. That you I, could I, find. Don't, I couldn't how find. Are you, how so, is so, that? How are you so, citing so, that no, stat? So, so a lot, number like, one. I couldn't find one, it anywhere. That was I had not the internet, to, but I'm pretty confident. I had a link to, to, some football outsiders numbers that I can't find anymore. Number two, Action Network had them number one in the country and have a great going into the last week of the regular season. Action Network. Action Network. Okay. So the the point is they were very Known close. Known analytics site, Action Network. 
And for those who don't know, um, havoc rate is basically just any negative play. It's it's fumbles, interception, sacks, tackles for loss, passes defensed, um, you know, anything like that. The point is, James Madison was really. No, I'm not really... questioning the havoc as a stat. I'm just. No, I, I'm. I can't find this anywhere, but I'm pretty sure <laughs> there's another. <laughs> That seems a suspicious setup to trying to say something reliable. You know what? You know what? You know, I can't find anywhere is your wallet when it's time to pay for the Pepsis. Yeah, that's um, true. That's true. <laughs> those expensive Pepsis, those uh, those $38 Pepsis that are floating around Bloomington. No, seriously. Um, the point is, James Madison's defenses were very disruptive. They were very, you know, sacks, tackles for loss, things like that. They were, you know, generally among the better teams in the Sun Belt the last couple of years, last two years. In, in turnovers created and, and those sorts of statistics. You know, we've said for a while, at least I've said for a while, it, it's felt like defense is going to need to be scheme a little bit this year because of some depth issues, some experience issues. Obviously, Indiana seems to feel good about what it did in the spring portal window, bringing in D'Angelo Pons and C.J. West to kind of shore up two of the, you know, maybe the biggest question marks on that defense. But if, you know, the, the more I think, if you're an Indiana fan, and I wrote this at the beginning of the week, the, the more you hear – um, the more you hear a a head coach talking about how pleased he is with the pass rush and the ability to get penetration and pressure from that defense, I think the more excited you're going to be because if you're not going to be a defense that can just go really deep at certain positions that's going to have a ton of experience, then what you need to be is a defense that can just force mistakes because if Indiana's offense can operate at the level that I think we think it can this season – if you can just find your way to kind of consistently forcing mistakes from the kinds of teams you want to be competitive with, you're going to give yourself the opportunities to score enough points. And I think that's, you know, it, it when Signetti kind of, you know, talked about that Monday a, a little bit unprompted, that kind of got my attention just because um, that's something this defense I think is going to have to have, at least early on. Yeah, I, 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 my concerns are twofold. I, I think that, you know, you mentioned depth, and we've talked a lot about that, but specifically up front on the defensive line, uh, uh, JMU is a team that let their tackles uh, specifically play a lot of snaps. You know, James Carpenter played, uh, you know, site we can cite, uh, a, a, a stat we can cite reliably. Um, you know, the second most snaps out of any defensive lineman in the Power Five or a defensive tackle in the Power Five last year. It, they're, that's not feasible against Power Five competition or power four competition in the big 10, that wear and tear that you're going to get, you're going to need to spell him. And they just, I don't know where that depth's going to come from uh, specifically at, at defensive tackle. And are they, is it going to be good enough to sort of do the things they want to do to, 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 you know, cause that havoc. Um, and then the second concern is their size in the secondary. Um, it's just really interesting to me. We talk about Sean Asbury who started, uh, in a spring game at safety, uh, you got Jameer Johnson and uh, D'Angelo Pons kind of working at corner. Uh, just a really small group, um, you know, it's kind of together. You get a little more size in the in the back end, back end. But um, just, you know, Asbury's listed at 5'9", 197. Uh, and D'Angelo Pons, I think, is the smallest guy on the roster in terms of weight. Um, and, and he's only 5'9", as well. So, um you know, I know, I know that I know he's gotten rave reviews in camp and everything, uh, but there are some bigger size receivers, and our our team's going to try to pick on that and use that to their advantage. And how's that all going to look when you just don't have? Uh, you, I, I just think that's very small for a secondary, especially when I mean, by his own by his own sort of pronouncement, Signetti said the uh, the defense relies a fair bit on man coverage. You know that that it's it's not a defense built to sort of like you know, use deception and, and disguise, right, not that right. you won't disguise coverages, but like when you run a lot of zone, it you, you tend to be trying to confuse, you know, a, a, a quarterback with just sort of moving parts around and having to wreck, you know, a quarterback having to recognize a lot of things pre and post snap. When you run man to man, what you're, you know, when you run a fair bit of man coverage, you are basically just saying, I trust certain players individually to be able to make plays, you know, um, and then, and listen, man is, is in a lot of cases preferable because number one, that means you have really good players. Number two, it frees you up to do other things. We've talked about like the, the potential impact of a player like Pons, for example. Um, but 
you know, if you are going to just sort of be in a situation where you're matching up, you know, one v one in certain areas, yeah, size can become a concern. And that's where, again, you know, if, if one hand can feed the other, if Indiana can be a little bit more disruptive up front, well, then suddenly a quarterback that's, you know, got a little bit of traffic in front of him or has to move his feet or has to shift his pocket isn't necessarily going to be quite as accurate or maybe recognize a read quite as quickly or whatever. So that's where, it, you know, it's it's um, every coach's favorite phrase, complimentary football, like the, the defense is going to have to help itself uh, this season. And, that, and and I go back, I mean, I have I have thought a lot about not a lot, but when I have thought about the defense, I have I have spent hours uh, on in. <laughs> well, all summer. that time you spent researching the stat that doesn't exist. So the yeah. uh, the, um, the going back to the spring game and being surprised at like how creative Bryant Haynes' play calls were, just because that's that's film that somebody can take and cut up and, and study of you. You tend to be a little bit more vanilla than it felt like Indiana was being in the spring game, but. You know, maybe Haynes just sort of felt like we're going to have to be good at this either way. So let's just practice it in a live setting. And um, if we put a little bit on film for other people, we'll just kind of live with that. So the last thing I want to talk about was um, uh, Bill Connolly's S&P Plus projections dropped this week. They dropped on Tuesday, I think. And Indiana, if I was counting correctly, is the lowest ranked team in the Big Ten. The Indiana was 81st. Um, which obviously is, you know, not going to get anybody super fired up. And, and I think I think Bill had, you know, one or two people in his mentions uh, asking why he wasn't feeling the Signetti enthusiasm. Um, the flip side, though, is, and, and I tracked this down, too, and I've got it in a tweet, um, seven of Indiana's nine conference games are 37, 40, in, in S&P Plus ranking, overall ranking, 37, 46, 75, 42, 32, 71, and 68. Michigan and Ohio State are, are outliers. This is a program that obviously, you know, too often in its recent history for its own liking, Michigan and Ohio State weren't outliers. It was having to go to good Iowa, you know, go play a good Iowa team on the road to open the season. It was having to, you know, peak Michigan State, Certainly Penn State, Michigan, Ohio State on its schedule all the time. Um, you know, we've talked about the non-conference schedule and, and Florida International's 127. Charlotte, I think, was 126. Obviously, Western Illinois is not even in the in this ranking because it's an FCS team. So the point is, if you're Indiana, you know, the numbers don't love you. But for the first time in a long time, the numbers do love your schedule a little bit. And I think that's it's just kind of a different way of framing this conversation that we've had a lot this off season, which is Indiana has quite a bit to prove if it's going to achieve what it wants to this year. On the other hand, you know, the, the, the wall it has to clear to kind of get from where it is to where it wants to go is, is not nearly so high or steep as it's been in the recent past. Like, is there a game for you? Uh, I mean, outside of Michigan, Ohio state, where you say that's not winnable. Not, not right now. Obviously, I mean, there's a couple that I wonder if they'll evolve that way. Like Nebraska, I think feels good about itself. I don't really know what to make of Northwestern or Maryland. You know, but I mean, like them. those, all the all the games feel like right now the talent level that. Yeah, it, there's yeah. not a ton, and especially a quarterback. I mean, you, you look at Maryland is is kind of a, a you know not in a great spot. Uh, Northwestern is not in a great spot. You know, Nor uh, Nebraska's quarter, that's kind of the, the different, you know, they got the, the freshmen, so it'll be interesting. But in terms of like going into the season, you look at the schedule and I mean, the two games outside those two games, you, you sort of say there's no reason they can't win most against most of these teams right now. And and I think that's a, like you said, that's a difference than, than the past year when you looked at Penn state last year, like, you know, no way. Um, and, and, you know, you, you just saw uh, teams that had a bigger talent gap. And and this year, I think um, with some of the way uh, they, they get they, they get lucky, right, with with Washington and UCLA going through. Well, the but it's, I, I guess the, I'm struggling and it's, it's partly because I've been locked in this IU bubble where Indiana has been punching up so much for the last, you know, 10 years or whatever. But the. I can't remember the last time I saw a team where there were kind of these dual accepted expectations or realities of like, 
Everybody in the conference thinks Indiana is going to struggle multiple places that were picked to finish second to last. Again, according, I mean, Bill's formulas are pretty reliable. Bill's a smart guy. He's been doing this for a long time. His formula sees Indiana as potentially the worst team in the conference. And everybody kind of accepts that Indiana is sort of starting from the back. But then on the other hand, everybody looks at Indiana and says, yeah, but manageable schedule, never know. And it's just sort of like, well, like, like where should we expect the intersection of those two things to be? Is it is it going to like if if it was like, you know, expectation versus reality this on graph, one line? This graph, this is this is amazing. You need and, a telestrator. <laughs> and like you know, basically ease of use on the other. Like we'll do the Kevin Wilson thing where we get the we get the fists going in different directions. Uh, like, is it going to be lost. that we underestimated Indiana? Is it going to be that the schedule was just that easy, or is Indiana going to fall short of what it thinks it can achieve this season? I just like it's it's fascinating to me that there is this team that suddenly like no one expects anything of except everyone else who looks at and says, yeah, I can see him in a bowl game because that schedule is just so nice. But I mean, how, how do you know? Right. Like, I mean, you know, I know yeah, you, don't. you don't, I don't know his, what the model is for that in, in terms of like taking into account that you have 46 new players. So it's like, how do you, I mean, how does that all fit? I mean, it could go anyway. Right. But I mean, I certainly you, you think hate computers, you hate analytics. I think that's I think, what you, no, you, I don't you hate shot analytics. Down but... havoc, right. You, you're, you're, I'm you're not the computers out. If you could actually cite the stat, I think it would be a great stat. I just think like I may have seen it once somewhere, and I couldn't find it. Is less reliable than than you know than you were making it out to be. But no, I, I think this team does have some upside. I and it, but I mean I think that you say that you know there is caution, and we've pointed out that things could go wrong. But I do think that this team has more upside certainly than it did last year when you were kind of looking at the roster. We'll leave it there for this week. We'll be back again next week. That'll be the last week of the preseason uh, before we are talking about at least building up to actual real live football. He's Mike Nislick. I'm Zach Gostrin for the Herald Times for the Star. This has been Mind Your Banners for August 15th, 2024. Thank you so much for listening. We will talk to you soon.